All right, Jude, we're going to look at verses 1 through 4. I noticed I didn't say a chapter because the book is a chapter, but Jude 1 through 4 is where we're going to be uh, this morning. Uh, I want to start off with a weird question. Have you ever been in a fight? Have you ever been in a physical fight? Well, I have been in just a few fights. Uh, younger, in my earlier days, I have been in a few fights. And the first fight I was in, I was about eight years old. My friend came over to my house, and he, we and I got this thing where we were playing all my Nintendo games. And I started to notice, like, every time he, was, he would leave my house, there would be a missing game. And so I, was, I started to figure it out. So I put one game out just to see where it would go. And so I put it out and I kind of went, oh, stepped away and I came back in and that game was not in the same place. And so I just assumed that he had it. And so I went up to him and I said, hey man, I noticed like the last couple times you've come over, these games that were once there are not there. And I put one out and it's not there right now. So give, give me the game back. He's like, man, I don't have your games. And so he had, this big, uh, he had this big winter coat on. And so I grabbed it, grabbed the coat, like trying to find it, and it fell out. And I felt so betrayed that I just, again, I'm eight years old, don't know Jesus. I punched him. And so I punched him, and we were rolling around on my living room floor, and I can hear, we're just yelling at each other, and it was kind of like that scene from Christmas Story when Ralphie beats up Scott Farkas. He's just yelling nonsense and fighting and wailing, and so my brother, who was in his teenage years, uh, saw this, heard us yelling, ran in the room, grabbed me, and I was so mad that I spit on my brother. That's how mad I was. And he took me by the shirt and put me up against the wall, and I said, okay, uh, and then he told my friend to leave, and I never saw that friend again. And I reacted poorly, but I felt betrayed and hurt, and honestly, I wanted my games back. Now, I, I wasn't ever a big or strong person growing up, so I tried to avoid fights as much as possible, which is, I think, a good thing most of the time. However, there are things worth fighting for. Of course, this doesn't mean that we have to turn to violence like I did for my Nintendo games, but it does mean that at times we should boldly use our voices and our passions for something, to advocate for something. Where we might even protest something wrong or even correct or call out when something isn't truthful or outright hurtful to others or ourselves. What are the things that are worth fighting for? That's one of the questions that I want us to ask this morning and throughout this series. How do we have discernment of when we should fight? And I think this is a timely thing to consider in light of the months ahead as a culture because we are starting to see ads, political ads of people fighting, aren't we? People saying, well, this candidate acts this way, so this is why you shouldn't vote for this. And this candidate acts this way, and they believe these things, and that's why you shouldn't vote for them. And so we have these sort of culture wars that begin to happen where we are uh, encouraged to fight each other. And then even the last election season, we saw a lot of people that were fighting for things they didn't even know what they were talking about. And then the people that you're hoping that would have a voice and would stand up, they say nothing. And so there are times that we need to understand uh, if or when we need to fight. And I don't think we should have a position where we're always one or the other. We always fight or we're always flight. I think there's times that we need to hold both things. And this is where what Jude is all about. It's all about believers in Jesus having discernment about when to step in and when to fight for the truth, or the truth of God's word and the gospel. And it wasn't written by a guy who loved conflict. Rather, it was written by someone who found it necessary to stand in and stand up for the right things. And so the big idea that I have in this series is how do we contend for the gospel in a way that honors God in whatever career stage of life or stage of life that we find ourselves in. And so a few things about this book before we get started. You'll probably notice right out of the gate as you turn there, it's one of the shortest books in the Bible. It's the shortest in the New Testament. If you don't count um, some of the first, second, and third John, if you count them as a collective, this would be the shortest 
shortest. These, there are only 25 verses and just 400 words in this short book, this short letter that Jude is writing. And if you want to understand what 400 words sound like, I have already spoken well over 400 words in this sermon, all right? And so this letter is to the point. And, and there's a reason why, it's because Jude doesn't want his audience to miss what he's trying to say here. Jude, or b- better pronounced Judas, or better pronounced Judah, you would imagine if his name was pronounced Judas, why he would want to be called Jude. Um, but Jude is the brother of Jesus. And there's one short mention of him that gives you a little insight. It's actually in 1 Corinthians 9. We're told that Jude was a, a, a traveling missionary where he's taking the gospel message around uh, the region where the apostles who saw Jesus' resurrection were to continue in Jesus' mission. And so Jude was this traveling missionary. Yes, he was the brother of Jesus, but he saw Christ die and resurrect, and now he's going to continue Jesus' mission. And according to 1 Corinthians 9, he's traveling around and telling people about his brother who he saw die and resurrect. And I don't know if you've ever been on a mission trip, but I, I encourage every believer at some point in your life to go on a mission trip, to go overseas, uh, to be around people that perhaps have limited access to the gospel. And what happens when you go on a mission trip, it's not only just life-changing to see a cross-cultural experience, but oftentimes you'll see people who actually repent and believe in the gospel. You actually see people get saved. And so Jude would have had this experience over and over again. Jude would have gone over in, in different places, in different regions, in towns and villages, and shared the good news of Jesus, and told them and saw the power of the gospel at work in people's lives. Some would have had no access to the gospel. They're hearing it for the very first time. Others who were a a Jewish audience that Jude was speaking to, they would have heard the gospel in a different way. They would have thought that coming to Christ meant I need to follow a bunch of rules. And so for Jude to go into these different towns and villages, some Greek, some uh, Jewish, it would sound something like this. Hey, I know that some of y'all have heard that God, to know God means to follow a bunch of rules and practices. But I want to tell you some good news. Jesus paid for your sin, that Jesus died for you, and Jesus has risen. And what he did on the cross is sufficient for you, so it means you don't have to work for your salvation. That the cross of Jesus Christ is enough. And this would have been received as good news for them, just like it is good news for us today. And so many of Jude's audience, as he's gone around to these different places, they would have heard this gospel message with joy and surrendered their life to Jesus. And they would have thought, man, we are free in Christ. We don't have to do all these things to earn salvation or to appease the anger or wrath of God toward sin. They would have thought we're free And Jude would have witnessed that. But here's the challenge, and here's what happened. Jude would have gone to all these different places, shared all these gospel messages, seen all these lives change. But years later, he hears that many of the places that he's gone to have now wrongly applied what it means to be free in Christ. And some thought, well, what it means to be free in Christ, well, that means I can just do whatever I want. And and, and in some cases, in many cases in which Jude is describing, some thought it was I could have sex with whoever I want. Some thought I I could spend money however I want. I can be greedy. I can be selfish. Does it matter? I am free in Christ. And does it matter what I'm doing? I'm going to go to heaven and I'm forgiven. So it was a really bad understanding of grace. And Jude hears this, and this would have been a great concern. And so he stops whatever he's doing. He's actually writing other letters to the churches, but he says, I'm going to stop, and I'm going to write this letter, which I feel is urgent, because I want to make them aware of they are walking outside of what the gospel calls them to. This is more of a um, wake-up call to them, this short letter. This is a sticky note to say, pay attention to this. This is a sign that you put on the floor when the floor is wet. This is wet floor. Don't walk over this. This is a quick uh, message for them to wake up because there's false teachers that have come into the church and they have taught this 
poor, inaccurate message of grace. But the church believed that this is the message that's helping us, this message of grace. But it was actually the message that was hurting them. You tracking? I don't know if you've ever had a plant that you've killed because you've overfed it or you fed it the wrong things or a pet that you have that you've overfed it or you fed it the wrong things and it died. I had a, a guinea pig as a kid. I don't know if you know what a guinea pig is, but it looks like a big hamster and a squirrel at the same time. And I remember having this as a kid and people thought, uh, people said, well, you need to make sure that it gets exercise. And so I thought, you know what's good exercise? Swimming. And so I had a swimming pool, I mean, a, a bathtub, and I, I put the guinea pig in the bathtub to watch it swim. I thought, thought, well, that's an exercise. Now, it's really interesting when they swim, they actually blow up these, they have these little cheek things that pop up that are like almost like flotation devices. It's really interesting. So I watched this thing swim around, and I would just pull it out and put it back in, watch this thing swim around. And eventually, I wore it out to both of them, both, I had two, both of them died. So I thought was helping was actually killing. Are you tracking? And we'll do this over and over again. The churches thought, well, this message of grace, this is helping me. It's actually hurting them because they misapplied what grace means. They misapplied what the gospel means. And so Jude is hoping that they would be cared for and know what it means to rightly Apply the gospel. And so in this passage, we're going to see what those wrong messages of the gospel were. And then we're going to see what they need in order to get back to a healthy, thriving relationship with Jesus. Y'all ready to go? Jude chapter 1, the only chapter. Let's go. Verse 1, it says, Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and a brother of, and the brother of James, to those who are called, beloved, in God, and the Father, and kept for Jesus Christ. He says, may mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you. Beloved, although I was very eager to write to you about our common salvation, these are the projects that he was working on before. He says, I stopped doing that. What did he do? He says, I found it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. For certain people have crept in unnoticed, who long ago were designated for this condemnation, ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into sensuality and deny our only Master and Lord, Jesus Christ. So a couple of things in these short verses. One, he's going to warn or he's warning the church about false teachers in the church. And then secondly, he then models, he also models for them what the, ty- the kind of teaching that will help them grow. And so I-, I hope that we can take away two things this morning that will help us. One is how to better spot false teaching. And two, how to better know ourselves in light of the gospel so that we can remain grounded. And so right out of the gate, I want to tell you uh, that we need to contend for the gospel because false teachers absolutely still exist today. I hope you hear that. They still exist today. In verse 4, he says certain people have crept in from inside the church and they have gone unnoticed So the false teachers, he's saying, they're in the church. And false teachers aren't necessarily, when we think of false false teachers, we think of, oh, they're out there. They're on TV or they're on social media. Yeah, but the, the warning is, be aware of the ones that are inside of the body of Christ. And I have to be honest, I, I'm not sure that we're aware of that often. Like, we don't realize how often false teaching can creep in into the church. Sometimes I think also we think that, well, false teachers, they just show up with a giant X or an upside down cross on their forehead. Like, hi, I'm a false teacher. I'm here to preach a different gospel today. No, false teachers are, are crafty. And one of the things that we can guarantee based on scripture is that 
The more time goes on until Jesus returns, the more we will see false teachers increase. Do you hear that? And they will keep getting better and better. And by better, I mean worse, like better and more deceptive. They are more deceptive. They will recruit recruit more and more people. They will be more attractive and harder to discern than ever. We can guarantee that. Jesus said it in Matthew 24 when he talks about the last days. The last days are from the time of Pentecost until uh, Christ returns. And Jesus says in those days, he's saying, you are going to see an increase in false teachers. And they will continue to recruit and deceive more people. What does Paul say to Timothy when he tells him to be aware of false teachers? He tells him in 2 Timothy 4, verse 3, he says, there's a time that is coming when people will not endure sound teaching. teaching. They won't like sound teaching. They won't be drawn to sound teaching, but what will they do? He says, instead, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. That is what Timothy says. This is what or Paul says to Timothy. This is what Jesus says to his disciples. Paul is saying, Jesus is saying, the New Testament, the Bible is teaching more and more people's ears will itch for false teaching and false teachers will get more clever and creative and they'll have larger numbers of followers and influence. That there will be wolves in sheep's clothing. And Jude, thankfully, tells us how we, how we can spot them. The first thing is they will mix heresy with truth. They'll mix heresy with truth. Notice verse 4, he says, people have crept in unnoticed. They crept in unnoticed because they also said things that were true. No heretic is going to say everything wrong. They wouldn't be a very good heretic if they said everything wrong. There will always be an appeal of something that is true. Have you ever heard the statement, uh, a broken clock is right, is wrong twice a day? Or no, right twice a day. A broken clock is right twice a day. Twice a day, it's going to tell the truth. But regularly, they're wrong. But a heretic, they're going to tell the truth. They're going to say something true and appealing. And I don't think we should just throw around the word heretic for anyone that we don't disagree with. Heretic is, or or heresy is something that is specific. It is against the essentials of our faith. For example, the Trinity. Jesus is the only way to salvation. That Jesus was born of a virgin. That Jesus was bodily resurrected. These are things that are essential to the faith. And anything that would go against that would be called heresy. And then there's like non-essentials, like uh, the mode of baptism, where you're baptized as an infant or baptized as an adult, or how you do communion, or uh, someone's view of speaking in tongues. Those are second-tier issues that are essential to salvation. But a heretic will teach something contrary to the essentials, something that is necessary necessary for salvation. The late Dallas Willard said that heresy in its nature always questions the sufficiency and the completeness of Christ. It will always take away from something that is essential to the faith. When I was starting out in ministry, I joined a church that didn't have a a pastor yet. And so because I was on staff, they asked me to be a part of the pastor search committee. It was a, a Baptist church that I was a part of, and they had a search committee for their next pastor. They said, would you sit on? And so we began to kind of have conversations about what kind of pastor we're hoping for. And then we got to theology, and what does this person have to believe in order to be the pastor? What are the things that are essential? Well, we had a, an experienced minister on that team. He was a deacon in our church at the time. And he had uh, ministry experience. He was seminary trained. One of the things that he brought up was, he goes, I think we need to take off the Trinity. Because I don't think a pastor needs to believe in the Trinity to come here. And he he started talking about why and gave his reasons why. And friends, I got to tell you that that is an essential truth to the gospel. Like, Jesus is God, right? And if he is not God, then his death on the cross and his resurrection, they mean nothing. And so he's saying, yeah, it's just not important. And we began to kind of battle with this guy, and we had to then quickly get him off that committee. (laughs) 
because he wanted to make sure that it didn't matter what, if we have a pastor who believes in the Trinity or not. Friends, that is heresy. And I gotta tell you also, that dude is not a Christian. Like if you cannot deny, you can't deny the Trinity and be a believer in Jesus. That is how essential it is to our faith. And so this is how quickly things can move into um, the church. Something that seems so subtle. Well, this guy's seminary trained. Of course he knows what he's talking about. No, you can't deny the Trinity and be a believer. That's heresy. And it happens all the time within Christendom. We see Christian names. They might say things that are really good and things that are really true. We see conferences and books and a list goes on. Someone can be right, but also so wrong. And we have to discern, yes, they said some things right, but what are the essential things that they believe about the faith? That's how we know how to spot heresy. They mix heresy with truth. He says people have crept in unnoticed. The next thing that he says in verse 4, quite simply, he says they are ungodly people. They're ungodly people. Now, of course, this doesn't mean that a teacher or a pastor has to be perfect because that would immediately disqualify me and every other pastor on the planet. But what he means is there's a pattern when it comes to sin. When someone brings a concern or a challenge to them about their behavior or about their actions or about their character, how do they respond Do they push away from from those who might hold them accountable? Are they teachable people? Are they known for, uh, if they get called out, are they known for avoiding steps of repentance and restoration and reconciliation? They push people away that would give them truth. I was just talking to a pastor this this past week who was on staff at a very a large church where the senior pastor was stating that he was receiving visions from God on how to lead the church. And he did so so that no one can speak into his life. And every person who spoke into his life, he would basically say that that person is against God. And he would eventually get rid of anyone who spoke any truth into his life by making up rumors about them so that they could be fired. And that happens all the time. That is ungodly behavior. And so false teachers, they have a ungodly track record. They are reckless and typically narcissistic while they remain unhealthy and not holding to the character of Jesus. They're unrepentant and land in blatant sin. And this is what Jude is warning the church against. He says they are ungodly, but not only are they ungodly, verse 4, they lead others to sin. Look at what it says. Who pervert the grace of God into sensuality. So not only are they ungodly, they, they are teaching away from the truth of Scripture, they're living an ungodly life, but also they're leading others to ungodliness. And this is a pastor or a teacher who might say, well, you're all under grace and it doesn't matter what you do. You can sleep with whoever you want to sleep with. You can live however you want to live. And this is a sign that you might be under false teaching is, that you are told to stay in sin that is obvious in Scripture. And this is an issue that Jude had with the church, and this is what sparked his attention to write this letter. Paul says it in in Romans chapter 6, are we under grace? Yes, but should that continue in sin? He says, absolutely not. Look at verse 1. What should we say? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? He says, by no means. How can we who died to sin Uh, still live in it. He's like, those things don't work together. And friends, we see this a lot, and a lot of churches move this way, specifically when it comes to sexuality, which was the issue in Jude's day. There's an issue of sexuality as becoming one of the things that is showing how the church will hold fast to the truth of Scripture versus giving license to sin in the name of inclusion. But if we aren't careful, we can fall into the lie that sin is not a big deal. And this heresy is not new. It happened in Jude's day, and it is even more pervasive now. And any teaching that says obvious sins in Scripture is okay, it would likely showing uh, its ugly, rearing its ugly head of um, heresy. And so not only is it ungodly and leading others to sin, but Jude makes it really clear. Verse 4, denies our only master and Lord Jesus 
Christ. Now, this is an outright denial of the gospel itself. And this would even sound like something that you could obtain your salvation outside of the work of Jesus. That's also denying. It's saying there's other things that you can do outside the work of Jesus to obtain the the righteousness of God. Because Jude says it's our only master and Lord. I want you to see this. The only master and Lord. So to say that there are other ways would be a false gospel. Perhaps you've seen pastors interviewed on TV shows or talk shows, and they're asked, what about other religions? Are they the same? And of course, you don't have to be cruel about how you talk about other beliefs, but a lack of clarity around this issue to make other religions equal or just another way to God would be a denial of what Jesus did on the cross. Anything that would add to or take away from Jesus' finished work on the cross, Jude would say that's a denial of our Master and Lord Jesus Christ. So these are ways that we can spot, hopefully, some ways that we can spot um, false teaching. And so these are examples, Jude says, that we might stand up in these situations to stand up and contend for the faith. When someone is saying that they belong to Jesus, but presenting a false view of what that means and how they live their life or walking in blatant, unrepentant sin, how they're teaching others then to follow in the same way or how they would outright deny what Jesus did on the cross, Jude would say, I'm writing this to you so that you would contend for the faith, that you wouldn't be passive but that you would use your voice, that you would be strong, that you would be bold, that you would speak up. How do we do this? Well, first of all, this is not going to happen through a social media blast. So put your phones down, all right? This isn't going around and yelling at people and saying, you're a false teacher. But there's a posture, though, that we would hold that Jude is advocating for. There's an attitude that we would carry if we want to contend well for the gospel. If you've ever been in an organization and you see their cultural values of how they want to be, like on their wall, maybe in a restaurant, or maybe you've seen it happen with a, a football or basketball or baseball coach, and they hold certain values that they want their players to have. One of the famous coaches, most prolific coaches of all time was uh, John Wooden. He was the coach for UCLA throughout the 60s, and he had 10 uh, national champion title, national championship titles, just more than any coach, and was known for teaching his players on and off the court. He actually wrote a lot of books on leadership, and one of the things he's known for is writing something called, or creating something called the Pyramid of Success. And it will show at the very top of the pyramid what we're all after. He said, competitive greatness. But at the bottom of the pyramid were things like uh, friendship and loyalty and enthusiasm. And so throughout the pyramid, there were things about the person's character that he hoped that they would obtain so that they would be great on the court. And by the way, nothing inside the pyramid had anything to do with basketball. It was all about their character, all about their behavior, how they would live their life. Because he believed that how you would live your life is what makes you a success on the court. And here's what Jude is doing. We don't know what church he's talking to, and maybe that's the point because it's really for us. And right out of the gate, there's something that Jude shows us. He goes, before we get to contending for the gospel, before you stand up to a false teacher or a heretic, or before you start to challenge things, I want you to know these things about yourself that are true, that you need to hold fast to, that you need to keep close to you. This is an identity so that it would lead to a certain way that you would conduct your life, a certain way that you would posture yourself before God and posture yourself before others. And this is what Jude is showing. And I want you to remember, Jude is the half-brother of Jesus. But Jude also says in the very first verse that he is a bondservant of Christ. The brother of Jesus says, I'm a bondservant of Christ. I got two boys. If one of them says the other is a bondservant, there's a bribe going on. Something's bad, right? So why is he saying that? Well, there's a posture. There's an attitude of how he sees himself in light of the gospel. And he says it really clear in verse 1. He says, I'm writing to those, he says, who are called, beloved in God the Father, and kept for Christ 
Jesus. These are three words that Jude wants them to know about themselves in light of the gospel so that they might contend well against false teaching. That you're called, that you're beloved, and that you're kept. Do you hear that, friends? Friends, I want to tell you, if you're a believer in Jesus, those three things are true about you. You are called, you are beloved, you are beloved, and you are kept in Christ. What does it mean to be called? Well, this isn't called like vocational ministry or called to be a missionary. Rather, it's called like when God called you into salvation. Romans 8, verse 30, Paul says, all he predestined, all he chose, he also called. It's when you heard the gospel for the very first time and it made sense. Like 2 Peter chapter 1, tells, he tells the believers to confirm their calling and election. He's saying, I want you to remember the time that you were called. Do y'all remember that time when this happened to you, when you were called? Or maybe you grew up in church your whole life and finally that one time you heard it and it was like, this was for you. Whoever was teaching it or preaching it, you're like, they're speaking this to me and it applies to me. I went to church a lot growing up as a kid. I mean, I remember hearing preaching, but it was just like, just white noise. But then there was one time I heard the gospel and I was like, oh, that's what that's for. This is for me. There's a time where I'm realizing I am now called. God is calling me. The gospel itself, that what Jesus did on the cross is not this universal truth. It is personal and it is for me. Friends, that is when Jesus, the Holy Spirit, is drawing you to salvation and you finally hear the gospel. Uh, John, throughout the book of John, he says, he who has ears, let him hear. Well, most people have ears, right? What's he saying? It's a spiritual awakening where you begin to hear the gospel, hear the good news of the gospel, and it becomes alive and it comes real to you. That's what he's saying. I want you to know that you were called. I have a lot of friends who, I have some friends who have been adopted and they'll often know their birth date, but they'll often know the date that they were adopted, the date that someone called me to be a part of my family. And they celebrate their birthday, but they also celebrate the day that they were adopted. I love that. It's the same thing with us, friends. If you're a believer in Jesus, it's important to remember. Maybe you don't know the day. It's okay. But remember the time period where you began to hear the sweet voice of the Lord speaking to you and calling you to be a part of his family this is what Jude is advocating for. Know that you are called, friends. Remember your calling. When you feel discouraged or beat down or downtrodden and you just feel like the weight of the world is on you, he says, I want you to remember, you are called. God, who created the world, says, I know you. You, are, you can be a part of my family. I'm calling you to myself. It's beautiful. Not only has he said you're called, but you're also beloved. And one of the things that confirms that you are called is that you finally know that I am loved by God. And this is when the gospel clicks. And it's not just some trivial thing that happened, but you realize God loves me. He died for me. You're loved in spite of all the messy or broken things in your life. This is what Jude wants you to know. You're called. You're beloved. And the next one he says is kept. 1 Peter 1, 3 he says that Jesus has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading. unfading. And he says, kept, kept in heaven for you. This is the inheritance of our salvation. It's everything that God has will be given to us. And Peter says and Jude says, you are kept this eternal life. He's kept you in his hand, and you will receive the inheritance that you're promised. And it's not an inheritance like property or money like we have here in a world where those things can be taken away or those things will definitely fade away. No, he says, First Peter says, it's imperishable, it's undefiled, and it's unfading. That our inheritance, this salvation, will be given to us, and nothing will ever take it away. Right before Jesus was betrayed and crucified, he prayed this very thing to the Father moments before he was betrayed. 
John 17, he says, Jesus is praying for the, to the Father, and he says, I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world. He's talking about you and me. He says, I am coming to you. Holy Father, look at what Jesus prays. Keep them in your name, which you have given me, that they may be one even as we are one. For in anyone who says that you can lose your salvation, just look at this verse. Jesus prayed to the Father that you and I would be kept to him in the same way that he is kept with the Father. Friend, that is how sure you and I can be that you are, we are in Christ, that his love that your salvation is not going anywhere, that you can mess up a lot of things and probably will if you're like me. But friend, you are kept in Christ. You're called, you're beloved, and you're kept. And so if you're gonna contend well, we have to remember these things about how God sees us. And these are the things that keep our posture toward God and toward others in check. These are the things that will keep us to be humble men and women. And I want you to hear these things for, for three reasons. One, if you're contending for the faith as a duty, this is something that I just have to do. I, I want you to see that it's not something that you have to do as much as it's something that you get to do. Not this heavy obligation. It's not work. It's just something that we get to be a part of. Look at what Jesus has done for you. He's called you. He be he's beloved you. He's kept you. So of course we're going to contend for the faith. It's something that we get to do out of response for all the wonderful things he's done for us. Secondly, if you see contending as a reason to act arrogant or superior, or even, I would even say cruel, perhaps remembering your salvation will invite you to stay humble in how you might interact with others who are wrong. Remember that you were um, called, that you're beloved, that you're kept. May that lead you to humility. And third, maybe you see contending as a daunting task, and maybe you're not, maybe you're conflict avoidant, and you go, man, I feel too afraid to do that, or maybe my, my challenge for you is allow these words to remind you that God is with you, that he saw you before you were born, that he chose you, he called you, he loves you, and he is keeping your salvation until you see him face to face, that he is with you. And so may these truths of the gospel be true and ready on our hearts, and may they be the things that drive us to contend well for Christ. And might we be the men and women who contend well for the gospel because we're called, we're beloved, and we're kept by the grace of of God. Amen. God help us. Let's pray. Father, we're so grateful and so humbled that before you knew us, you chose us. And Lord, as you chose us, you called us. And Lord, for some of us in this room, perhaps we feel weary and we feel, Lord, just the, the, the grief that this world can often bring us. Lord, might we remember our calling? Might we remember the time that Christ called us to himself? And might we know then we are beloved? Might we remember that time that we said, oh, this is what the gospel is, and this is what Christ has done for us? Might we remember that we're kept, and it has nothing to do with our performance or all the things that we try to do to earn righteousness? Lord, it's all your work that we are kept and Lord, no matter what mistakes we'll make along the way, that we are still kept in you, that you still love us, and you still promise us our inheritance as, you, as anyone would of a loved son or daughter. That's the position that you hold us to. And so, Lord, I pray that we would hold that well, Lord, that we would see our identity in you well so that we might feel confidence and um, boldness and humility to contend for the gospel that we would be able to discern what is false and what is untrue that is said about Christ or about the gospel. And we would stand up and take a stand and proclaim boldly who you are and what you can do. And so God, I pray for those in this room who have never applied the truth of the gospel to their life. I pray, Lord, that you would call them right now. 
And Lord, that you would allow their blind eyes to see the gospel. And they would know that they are beloved. And then through that, Lord, they would know that they could be kept in you. And so, Lord, I would ask that this morning, that you would save those who are far from you this morning. And they would enter into this relationship with you and you would change them from the inside out. And God, I pray that we would just walk and to contend well for the gospel. In Jesus' name, amen.